I'm a firm believer that farmers were the first environmentalists. We are very much intricately related to the land and what we do to it. We at The Orchard happily call ourselves carbon negative. We clean the air by and large with the trees that we're planting. The larger orchard is downwind from Boise, and then obviously our Wallula Ranch is right next door. What they do will affect us in the surrounding area. We are very concerned about global warming and its potential side effects because we are very much at risk to the elements that be. You know, at the Boise Wallula Mill, we realize we have a big environmental footprint, but we also realize it's incumbent upon us to operate in ways that minimize that footprint. And when you think about it, it makes sense. We rely on healthy forests, clean water, and clean air to make the paper and paper-based packaging products that are used around the world. With climate change, you know, one of the things that we're hearing right now is we need to figure out what to do with carbon. 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 Can you see carbon? You know, it's, it's one of those things that uh, it's, it's hard to connect to, but we're learning more and more that it's very real. And the phraseology we hear a lot is, how can we sequester? How can we park carbon away so it doesn't enter into the atmosphere? The evidence has just become crystal clear that climate change is happening and that we need to do something about it. CO2 sequestration will be part of the solution and I think if we develop the technology here in the United States, it's really a good thing to be exporting this technology and the know-how. That's something that we can offer the world. Now, we are engaged in one of the most interesting scientific experiments around. We're looking at sequestering CO2, man-made CO2, anthropogenic CO2, in basalt formations. And while geologic sequestration of CO2 is not the newest thing on the block, people are doing it across the country, and most groups that are working on it are working on DOE, Department of Energy Projects, but they are looking at sequestering CO2 in sedimentary rocks. What we're looking at is to sequester it in lava flows. What we've seen in the laboratory are experiments that show that basalt will react with CO2 to make calcite and other minerals. So what we're looking at doing is not just pumping CO2 down where it will stay safely and be stored, but we're looking at places where it would mineralize. And when it forms a mineral, it is sequestered. It is there for good. In the early 80s, uh, there was some work being done out here on the Hanford site to characterize these uh, deep basalt formations. And then we just had this idea, well, it's a massive geologic structure, uh, covers most of Oregon and Washington State. We know there's these similar structures elsewhere in the world. Nobody's looked at it for sequestration. We ought to at least see, is there some potential? So we started with a very small little project, some simple experiments, just to grab core samples, put them in pressure vessels, and expose it to CO2, and CO2 water mixtures, and have a look. Frankly, when we first started this, we didn't think we'd see much. Now, much to our surprise, when we opened up those first experiments and began to look at the uh, basalts, what we found were these beautiful crystals, calcite crystals, calcium carbonate crystals, covering the uh, basalt grains. And they'd only been in the vessels for periods of uh, weeks to months. So at that point, that's one of those kind of eureka moments that uh, sometimes you have that's rare in, your, in a scientist's career. You look at it and say, wow, that was completely unexpected and we better look at this in, in some more detail. My students and I in a mineralogy class went over to Pacific Northwest National Labs and toured Pete McGrail's lab and saw CO2 in its supercritical fluid form, saw some of the um, results that they had of the in-situ 
formation of carbonates in different kinds of basalt. And the students just came alive with this because they care very deeply about the environment. And I think they're keenly aware that they're inheriting a problem. And I think the students at Whitman are maybe a little bit impatient with people of other generations who don't seem to have the same urgency that they do about tackling this problem. So I think they were really excited to see the intellectual skills and the equipment resources at PNNL and see how that's being devoted to these projects. If we were to look at the geology of the area out here in eastern Washington, what we would see are a number of layers. We would see dirt and sand and soil and gravel. And beneath that, we get these layers of basalt, about eight to 10,000 feet thick layers of basalt. From a sequestration point of view, the aerial coverage is important, yes, but it also has to have thickness and depth. So we're fortunate in the way these things are structured uh, here in the Pacific Northwest in the, in the Columbia River Basalt Group, there's as many as 300 of these flows. Each one of these lava flows tends to have a very dense middle layer, and then it has a busted up bottom and a busted up top. So we will find intervals where we have very thick lava flows, and those are going to be our seals. And little layers where there was bubbly gas layers where it's broken up that will have uh, lots of porosity and lots of storage capacity. The things we do here in the lab, those are all really important and it's essential we do, but we can't really make a determination about whether this is practical unless we do these field studies. You know, a nice way to think about this is like a scientific experiment. That's what this is. This is the first step on a long scientific journey, a process to determine whether it's possible to permanently store CO2 in basalt. Boise was proud when Battelle knocked on our door a number of years ago and suggested we partner with them on this project. It's an opportunity for Boise to live by its principles of environmental stewardship. When you're going to drill a well and do a test injection of CO2, you want to be very sure that you know where you're putting it. You need to know as much about the layers as possible. You want to be in an area that's seismically stable. So to do that, we designed a new kind of seismic survey. And it involved bringing big thumper trucks out uh, and lots of sensors and getting special sensors we call geophones and laying them out and designing the survey and then testing it. So in December of 2007, we ran the thumper trucks up and down and we collected the data and we were very pleased to see that there were no big faults down there and that it was safe to proceed with drilling a well and in doing our small injection test. What we do is we test uh, different horizons as we go down and when we see rocks that look interesting, we stop. We collect data on them and we're looking for intervals that have porosity, that have storage capacity. We're looking for intervals that will make good seals. This site is uh, absolutely unique in the world too. Uh, of course, we're on the paper mill property. Uh, we have uh, road access right there, so there's a road just adjoining the site, but not just a road, there's a rail spur. So we have, we have our field site, a road, and a rail spur, and uh, I'm sure we're going to be able to work out a schedule where we can bring a, a rail car in that's now got our pressurized uh, CO2 and uh, literally hook a hose up from our rail car to our uh, wellhead and uh, have the CO2 go on the ground. There, there is absolutely no other field site in the world. Uh, that would have a, a situation like that. When we find one of these rubbly, crumbly layers, then we will inject only about a thousand metric tons of CO2. We inject it down the borehole through tubes, and when it reaches our crumbly zone, it's all full of water, it will form fingers that trickle out and push out into that horizon and it's lighter than the water, so it will kind of start trickling and moving up. 
it will take maybe only a few weeks of mixing with the water or touching the rock to start forming crystals. And what it does is when it encounters glassy parts of the basalt, little bits that came out very fast and didn't really form crystals yet, that's the part will be most reactive. So that's when it will start making the crystals. And we think it will line those rocks with little layers of crystals. Our project is just a very small first test. And so when we find out, yes, this works here at this particular small amount of CO2 in this particular spot, what we would like to do then is to do a larger test and see, do different basalts react differently? What can we predict? What have we learned? How can we take the technology that we're developing and apply it to other places? Can we go then from the laboratory scale to the small field scale and then to a larger scale? And finally, is it ready for commercial? Is it ready for prime time? A, a good companion to curiosity, you know, that essential part of, you know, the driver for science is also imagination. And imagination is so key for being able to think about solutions to problems. And so when I look at the project right now uh, to be able to test over there at Wallula about if the deep basalt can grab that carbon and retain it, I'm really curious about that. And it arouses my curiosity and then it also arouses my imagination of, what, whoa, what, you know, what could, if, if we prove that as, a, as an effective tool, what then can we do with that? And, and I relish having that conversation of what can we do with it. But that's a whole other conversation that we can only have if we have the proof or concept for it. This type of project, more than I think any other uh, scientific endeavor that certainly I've been involved in, its, its purpose is not for we scientists to be going to meetings and talking to other scientists in the end. It won't help anything if we sort of just advance the science and can't make any decisions about whether we can do, actually do this in a, in a commercial basis. Uh, primarily because if the public doesn't grasp, understand, and believe that what we're doing is uh, safe, permanent, and effective, then the science may be fantastic and there's some good to that. But in terms of trying to solve this climate challenge, if we don't have the public coming right along with us, then it isn't going to matter. It won't, it won't matter in the end. One criticism made oftentimes of academic scientists is what they're doing doesn't seem to have very many applications. And I think that this project is really exciting because it does have the potential to really pay off, to really make change within my lifetime and my children's lifetime. At Boise, our environmental principles don't just call for environmental compliance. We want to operate in ways that really meet the spirit of those laws. We want to operate in ways that are truly environmentally, socially, and financially sustainable. This partnership allows us to demonstrate our commitment to continuous environmental improvement. I sense there's a fresh breeze, a real fresh wind coming in about um, how science can enter into the public conversation. We do need solutions. We do need, we need to find ways to sequester carbon. If we want good technology, if we want better technology, we, we need to recognize that it's these experimental companies that are actually researching these things that need the support to be able to do what they do. I'm not going to give up. I'll keep going. I believe in this and, and uh, want, to, want to find out. There's a, a technology, technological solution that we think can work and it's so important to get an answer so I wouldn't give up. I'm going to keep going until I can, can determine whether this will help or not. <laughs>